first two years of the Trump administration, more than 1,600, as I just mentioned, 1,600 federal scientists left government service, according to the Office of Personnel Management. So how do we bring back leading scientists and academics and engineers and just thought leaders back to government? And what does the federal government need to do to be competitive in attracting the next generation of these talented professionals? Our final guest, a very good friend of mine from a long time ago, my team did not know that, is the former acting secretary of energy and also the former founder and director of ARPA-E, a place I really love. Dr. Arun Majumdar is currently a professor of mechanical engineering and photon science at Stanford University, one of the smartest people I know. Arun, great to see you. Uh, it's been a number great of years, my friend. Thank you. Uh, I should also mention, you know, without compromising him at all, Arun is on everybody's shortlist eventually to be Secretary of Energy someday. So I can, since he's not there yet, we're going to have Jennifer Granholm, I can ask him, you know, tough questions about, about this world. But Arun, I, I guess my first question is, is, how worried are you what is your decibel level, your DEF CON level, about how, you are con uh, how concerned you are about our level of competence and expertise in government today to handle energy, to handle some of our big uh, uh, science-based issues in the nation today? First of all, fantastic program. I hope the whole country is watching this program and how to sort of build the staffing. At the end of the day, the, all of these organizations, whether it's federal agency or staff on the Hill, it's all about the people. And I think getting the people right is extremely important. Let me just first say on the scientific side, it really starts from the top. Hmm. You have a president who ran on science. I think it was a stark reminder in the days of COVID-19 that science matters. And so when the president is saying science matters, it sort of sends the signal to the whole team that this is really, really important. But that's just the message. The second thing President Biden did was to identify a science advisor, uh, Eric Lander, who is a top-notch scientist. And that has sent a signal to the scientific community that he's picking the best. But that was not enough. He has also done something that a lot of previous presidents have not done, and probably, and I don't know my history that well, probably the first time in the history of the United States that he's elevated the science advisor position to the cabinet-level position. It is the first really time. It is the first time in history. He's really in the room. Yeah, it I'm is sorry? the first time Go in ahead. history. No, it is the first That's time right. in history. I, as I'm writing about it right now, so I went back to look. So you're right. It's the first. So not to interrupt, but you're right. That's right. And, and so, and given the fact that he will be will be in the room where decisions are made, it's going to be extremely important. And when you have people like that in the team, it attracts other scientists and engineers who to go there and actually serve in a very meaningful way. And so, uh, so that's one thing. The second thing that the President Biden has leaned into is the idea that energy and climate matters. And not only that, he's connected the dots between energy and climate to economic development and jobs. Building infrastructure to handle climate issues is the route to creating jobs. And finally, he's also connected that and elevated the issue of environmental justice and equity. So if you look at the whole spectrum of things, it, it, it's, it's the first time in history, I think, that all of these are connected. And that certainly not only requires building on the current career staff that is already there in the Department of Energy, Department of Interior, and other places, but also bringing in new talent, new scientific talent, to be able to address this with the pace and scale that the United States deserves. So let me ask you a question about that ecosystem you just described. And I actually think what you described is very powerful. I talked to the membership of Research America the other day, and I said, by elevating Eric Lander to a cabinet level position, it's a comment on science that's very hard for a future administration to come in and say, we're gonna downgrade science. We're gonna no longer, so it's an interesting step that may be hopefully, I think, hopefully in my view, irreversible. But when you're talking to your students, you're talking to your young engineers, you're talking to people around the country that are coming in at Stanford and the many people I know you speak to, do they feel that pull? Are they attracted back now? Absolutely. I mean, this is, you, you read my mind in this, in this regard because the youth of this country, which I deal with on a daily basis, you know, really see this as their issue. Um, I can't tell you how much the last four years of, of taking the eye off the ball on climate and getting out of Paris Agreement, et cetera, that has really motivated 
the youth to say that we got to do something about it. And and I'm not talking about just youth, you know, the, the students at Stanford. I mean, I, I, I travel around the country, not now, but at least I interact with the with the students in uh, across the country. And this is something that they really care about. So I think you're going to see a huge, uh, you know, sort of a, uh, a pull to serve, to do public service with science in mind. And I think it's a tremendous opportunity for the Biden administration to be able to attract young people through various mechanisms to bring them into the government. We're getting close to the end here, which I really regret because I love talking to you, Arun. But I want to talk about you're in my favorite subject, or it used to be your favorite subject, it's mine, which is ARPA-E. And someday I will write that book about ARPA-E and its founding. Because for folks that don't know, it's sort of the uh, an energy department um, sibling of DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. But ARPA-E was a bit different, and this is my take on it, is that the magic of ARPA-E is it provided um, risk funding. It helped to go out and create lots of ideas, a thousand flowers bloom in the new renewables, energy, you know, anything in the kind of broad energy space and innovation. But it wasn't government trying to do it all. It was partnered with this space in the private sector. And it worked a lot about how do you get incentives right between what government could do, what the private sector could do, and that magic, you know, could, could, could happen. And I saw it happen uh, over and over and over again. And I guess I'm wondering, as I mentioned earlier in the program, we don't have that deep, deep um, expertise um, in many of the areas that we need. It needs to be lured back, and that will take time. I'm just wondering, is there something in your experience of creating this environment that was part government, part private, get the incentives right, to begin solving some of these public problems we're going to have because we don't have it? So I know that's a big meta question, but I know that you're the one who can answer it. First of all, can I just thank you for engaging with RPE and the RPE summits? And, and not just a few times, many times you'll be a perennial invitee for the <laughs> RPE summits. And, but thank you for doing that, because it really highlights to the American public that fundamental research into breakthrough technology is critical. That is the role for the government. And it may not pay off in two or three years, but we are now seeing the benefits of that coming out in the public sector. For example, one of the technologies that we had funded, we did not know whether it's going to work or not. Eventually, it worked out. It, the company went public this year, uh, or last 2020, end of 2020, and it was initially valued at $3 billion. Right now it's about like 20 or $30 billion. It's gone up. And it has, it's going to create a whole new battery for the electric vehicle market and many other markets. So that's an example. There are many other such examples that fundamental research, just like we saw DARPA develop the technology for the internet, that completely changed the ball game for not just the United States, for the whole world, I think we are going to see that happen in the energy climate. And it's absolutely necessary, given the urgency and scale of the problem. And we're going to see that happen. So the role of the government in funding fundamental research towards breakthrough technologies to create the foundation of new industries that did not exist before, is that that's exactly the role of RP, and it requires the private sector. Now, one of the things that your former, uh, one of the former speakers, Dr. Newcomer said on, on the Intergovernmental Personnel Act. I think it's a tremendous opportunity to attract the talent from the universities to bring them, bring them into the government. I think in the, in the Department of Energy, we are very fortunate that there are 17 national labs which are there for science and engineering and technology development across the board. And they could be tapped in as well. So I think there's Tremendous scientific talent, uh, and, and it's it's a question of can we bring them in quickly enough to really accelerate the pace of research and development, and frankly, at the end of the day, it's jobs, it's our economy. Well, I will say to my audience, Dr. Arun Manjumdar, is if we get into a whole different energy future, he's going to be one of the primary architects of that professor of mechanical engineering and photon science at Stanford University, uh, founding director of ARPA-E at the Department of Energy, uh, and my good friend Arun Majumdar. Thank you so much for anchoring today's program and your thoughtful and candid uh, views today. Thank you, Steve. Great to be back. That brings us to the end of our program today. A big thank you to Nokia for its support of this, these set of conversations and all of you in the audience for joining us. For those of you who missed any of the conversations this afternoon, we'll have a video up from the event on our website shortly. I'm Steve Clemens. Be well.